Well, thank you very much on such a rainy day, all our North Decatur friends. But also, I particularly want to acknowledge the people who have arrived here who are not in North Decatur, Dr. Gambello and our state friends here. Uh, appreciate very much. Um, this is our second Lent and Learn for this year, um, and a very important topic uh, dear to my heart, one long-term follow-up. Um, uh, and also, um, I, I, we will probably be taping this today, and it'll be available online, so if you want to tell your colleagues to watch it later. Um, the other good news I did want to share with you as a part of these HRSA activities, we did get the funding again for next three years. So, the ACMG, so, so we will continue some of the work with long-term follow-up and the telemedicine piece integrated with this. So with that, that I'm going to have Aicha, uh, our project manager for HRSA, who has been wonderful at helping me coordinate all this. Let her introduce my dear friend and a colleague who I admire a lot and her work, um, uh, Dr. Brower. So. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out on such a rainy day. I'm going to be introducing Dr. Brower, who works on several projects at the American College of Medical Genetics, and, and she's also working on part of the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development's Newborn Screening Translational Research Network and HRSA's National Coordinating Center for the Regional Genetics Network. Amy, Amy's work focuses on creating informatics platforms to collect, analyze, visualize, and share longitudinal clinical and genomic data. Dr. Brower has a background in medical genetics, genomics, newborn screening, translational research, molecular diagnostics, and bioinformatics. She was a member of the Human Genome Project and developed molecular diagnostic and informatics platforms over a decade of work in the device industry. Dr. Brower serves on several advisory boards and is a former member of the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children. Amy received her doctorate degree in medical genetics at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and she'll be talking to us today about the longitudinal pediatric data resource. Thank Thanks. You. Do I use this and that? Okay. <laughs> clinicians, researchers, public health, newborn screening partners, all thinking about the world of newborn screening and knowing that most newborn screening conditions are rare and although we screen and identify those newborns, they're often followed throughout the lifetime. So we want to begin to collect information to better understand disease, how we're doing with newborn screening, and to improve treatment and outcomes. So next slide. Um, so just going to give you a little bit of background, talk about what we've been doing at the national level, um, focus a little bit on the NBSTRN, the Newborn Screening and Translational Research Network, and then the NCCs and the regional collaboratives, which, you know, we consider CERT the national leader of the regional collaboratives, so it's on tape, I guess, you know, for posterity. <laughs> um, so I won't get invited to Heartland anymore, <laughs> but, but CERC has definitely been leading the way in long-term follow-up. I'll give you a little bit of a taste of the data that we're starting to roll in, and we would love to have your ideas on how you might like to use the data or how we could be doing a better job. Next slide. Um, so when I think about newborn screening, I always think about it, you know, beginning before the child is born, hopefully with a discussion with the prospective parents about what's going to happen, both with the taking of a blood sample for the dry blood spot as well as the physiological testing that's done in the neonatal um, nursery. The goal is to obviously have early detection and early treatment for disorders that can be detected in the newborn period and where early treatment is important. Um, we want to think today, if you click one more step, we're going to focus on that last area of clinical care and long-term follow-up. So that's one of our areas that we focus on at ACMG. Next slide. So we're working to um, you know, build a lot of tools, but we've had a lot of help from the Secretary's Advisory Committee and from other national partners and, you know, really clinical researchers around the country. Is it okay? It's not here. Okay. Oh, good. They didn't hear that. <laughs> um, so we have been um, helped out by our work um, 
at the national level. So if you just click through, so Dr. Harvey Levy is sort of a you know a thought leader in newborn screening. He told us a few years ago, you know, what do we know about newborn screening and what don't we know? So you know, using that as an effort in long-term follow-up, we wanted to begin to frame what do we mean by long-term follow-up. So you can click through a few of these key publications that really begin to frame our work. With the last one is um, the latest. Um, you can click again. The latest effort by the Secretary's Advisory Committee to really lay out in a detailed framework, and Dr. Singh was part of this work group, to lay out in detail what should we be asking. If we're going to follow these kids, if we can follow these kids, what would you ask as clinicians, as genetic counselors, as newborn screening partners in public health? What would parents want asked? What would families want asked? And what do our federal funders want asked? So at, a, at all these different levels, we want to think about how to do that. And I can click through if that's easier. We have this hand over here if that doesn't matter. Oh, sorry. Um, so the Secretary's Advisory Committee really defined for us long-term follow-up and basically said it. We want to ensure the best possible outcome for individuals who are identified with a condition through newborn screening. They identified really four central components, care coordination through a medical home, evidence-based treatment, continuous quality improvement, and new knowledge discovery. If you think about each one of those areas, I bet you can put yourself into one of those buckets or many of those buckets, depending on what you do every day with families and with patients that you see in your clinic. Um, Long-term follow-up is not new. I remember that Dr. Thorell has talked about it, you know, for years. And in the old days, um, they looked, they used the performance and evaluation and assessment system where they had nine key questions. And Dr. Thorell and his team, funded by HRSA, went out to each state program. They focused on the screening and the short-term follow-up and diagnosis, but they did include a focus on long-term follow-up. So as we began our work in long-term follow-up, we never want to reinvent the wheel. We want to take all of the c gathered expertise and build on top of that. And that's why we're here today to learn, you know, show you guys what we've been doing and learn from you on what we sh can be doing better. Um, we think about the advisory committee statement and these overarching questions that the Hinton paper that Dr. Singh was part of really framed for us, thinking about families, medical home, and the state and nation. And then ultimately, we hope to begin to roll up some of these quality measures to the National Quality Forum, which really looks at how are we doing across all kinds of health care. There are some newborn screening measures that are part of the National Quality Forum. There's one that's focused on newborn screening, and it basically says, have um, newborns been screened by six months of age? So a pretty low bar, but we can build from there. There are quite a few questions about hearing loss, because that has been a group that's taken their ideas to the National Quality Forum. But it's an effort that we're working on in the advisory committee at a federal level to take all of your great ideas and say, if these were the key questions, and that's what we were talking about last night. If you could ask key questions, what are they? Um, and how can we roll that up into seeing how we're all doing in our prospective careers? Um, so the advisory committee, again, just had a little bit of detail. And these are in the slides for you to take a look at. Um, so it really framed for us what questions should newborn screening be able to answer um, across all of the four key components, care coordination, evidence-based treatment, quality improvement, and new knowledge discovery, and then built some questions out for us across those different stakeholder groups. So at a national level at ACMG, we are funded to do coordinating centers, coordinating centers for MBSTRN and the NCC that works with the regional genetics collaboratives. So we wanted to leverage the clinical experts that we were um, cajoling into work at the MBSTRN through ACMG's connections. We wanted to include state newborn screening programs, and we wanted to include advocates. And to think about, you know, you all know that advocates have really driven a lot of newborn screening activities. So we wanted to include patients and families in all of our efforts. We came together and we formed what we called a joint committee. So this is made up of folks at the NCCRC level and the MBSTRN level. So the joint committee um, really focused on beginning to create some infrastructure. So at ACMG, we coordinated two data work groups. We had 14 members, two from each of the regional collaboratives, 
22 members on what we call the MBS here in clinical centers work group where um, over three quarters were practicing clinicians so seeing patients every day um, and then we wanted to bring together all of these different projects as I said we don't want to reinvent the wheel there were already projects going on there were what HRSA called priority projects this was the early days of the Sue Berry project the inborn errors of metabolism collaborative and Piero Ronaldo's effort to look at analytical validation of new screening technologies through the Region 4 Stork, and now um, Mayo calls it the Clear Cla um, Clinical Laboratory Information Resource. So we wanted to understand what was already going on. We wanted to work with national partners just across the street, or I guess across the street from where I was last night at the CDC. You know, they do a big role in newborn screening. You guys know they do the quality improvement and quality assurance. They're the ones who, when we have a great idea to do a new technology, they make the QC material. So they're often ahead of us, maybe even a few years or decades, thinking about what could we do in the newborn screening period. So we wanted to bring together CDC, the National Library of Medicine, and then the Office of Rare Disease Research. What does NLM have to do with it? Well, if we're going to collect information across a lifespan. We've got to be doing it in the same way. So sometimes I use a slide that shows, you know, if you're going to order roses for Valentine's Day, um, you know, it, it depends whether you have a red rose or a white rose. They're all roses, but they're very different, <laughs> obviously, in how they look. So we all have to collect information in the same way so that we can put it together and learn more about the kids that we're taking care of. So in the joint committee, we had a lot of objectives, and it was really to create a shared system, a shared system across definitions, across standards, across the tools that we're using. We wanted to have security. So long-term follow-up data, even if we don't collect names and addresses and, and things that you do in your EMRs, we're collecting dates of visit. Visit dates are personal health information. So for us at ACMG to create this information technology suite, we had to go through a multi-year process by NIH review and become what's called FISMA moderate. And FISMA moderate follows legislation that governs how IT systems at the government level work. We're contractors to the government. So we're essentially building IT systems for NIH. And so we have an authority to operate. We can collect names and addresses and dates of birth. Longitudinally, you need to have those dates, a date when an MRI was done, a date when a muscle biopsy was done, a date when a functional assessment on IQ or speech was done. We have to have dates in our data. So we had to you know, put a lot of resources behind creating a secure data management system. Um, we had a scope of work. Initially, we were focused on the conditions that are part of routine newborn screening. Um, we wanted to think also about new conditions because if you think about it, the Secretary's Advisory Committee has a system to look at new conditions. So it looks at analytical performance of a technology. Is there a treatment? Do we understand the disease? And then they get added to the panels, things recently like Pompeii and MPS1 and now XALD. That evidence-based review process could benefit from long-term follow-up activities that maybe happened before they get recommended to the Secretary's Advisory Committee. If we had coordinated research, we might understand more about these diseases before they get added to routine newborn screening. Um, so we wanted to think about the four components of long-term follow-up, and I bet you guys can say all those four components by heart by now. Um, and then we wanted to think about um, the legislation. So actually, all of our work and all of your work with the HRSA-funded NCC and RCs is legislated in the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act that was just reauthorized in 2014. It also calls out NIH to build the Hunter Kelly Newborn Screening Research Program that the MBSTRN is part of. So we're part of legislation. The nice thing that comes along with, comes along with that is funding. So we have a funding stream um, that can fund these efforts, and it especially calls out in the law 
that we should be doing management and outcomes-based research. So we need to manage these cases and um, see how we're managing them across the lifespan and then begin to put that data together. So potentially, if we're collecting all of this data, what could we do with it? We want to build a national data set. We could, with that national data set, maybe do investigations like natural history of the diseases. We can look at a research level and have hypothesis-driven um, research at the public health level. We could look at service utilization across the United States, maybe need for telemedicine, need for outreach clinics. Um, and then we can have national benchmarks through the National Quality Forum. So I don't know how to draw this picture exactly. You guys are the ones that are going to draw this picture. We're going to make sure the tools are there and that you can put the information in places, but we want you to figure out how could this data be used. But as we think about it, we want to think about what questions can we ask and what questions would you guys want to ask. So this is just one example. If I was an investigator, I might want to ask about describing the clinical course of newborn screen identified conditions in which patients are asymptomatic. If I was a grantee who had a um, NIH funded, I might want to look at the relationship between CFTR genotypes and lung function. And then at public health level, describing the relationship between service delivery and treatment and methods to define optimal um, follow-up care plans in children with MCAT. Those are just some examples. You guys might have way better questions than me, given the data that we have in there. And hopefully, um, after this talk, you'll have some great ideas on what we should do. So MBSTRN, we are funded by NICHD. We're in our second five-year contract. We're in year eight. So we have two more years to sort of wrap things up and show that we've done a good job. We're really focused on new technologies, new conditions, and new treatments. So I think about our work as across the lifespan, again, prenatal, screening, diagnosis, and short-term short and long-term follow-up. How can we build research tools to foster each of those areas, and how can we look across different populations? Whether we're looking at the natural history of screen conditions, we're looking at candidate conditions right now, like um, SMA or Duchenne muscular dystrophy or you know Fragile X. We want to think about what is going to be coming sort of down the pipe in newborn screening. We want to have that public health focus because the folks in public health are really, they're the heart of newborn screening. And so we want to be able to, as they want to follow these kids too, and ho know how outcomes are, how the kids are doing with outcomes, we want to give them the tools um, to do that. And then with sort of new advancements, we want to understand genomics in the newborn period and how that maybe can play into um, helping improve diagnosis. So at MBSTRN, we have different areas of focus. We have a big coordinating center in Bethesda. I think it's an N of three, but they do a really great job. As Mike Watson's teams are very small, but somehow get a lot of work done. So we've got um, project managers and coordinators in Bethesda that really work with research public health and um, clinicians across all of our different activities. We want to help um, researchers and, and partners discover novel technologies, advance our understanding of these diseases, and develop new treatments. So we're beginning to work with pharma, molecular device um, industry, and other partners to begin to really realize if we were going to screen for these conditions, what do we need to have in place? MBSTRN has built several tools um, that you can look at our website and learn more about them. Um, we're trying to build this collaboration. So this is sort of one of a slide that I get asked people want to use it a lot. And because it sort of sums up what we're trying to do at MBSTRN, we're really thinking about pilots. Most of them are NIH initiated, but you can see HERS is beginning to fund implementation pilots. So at the same time, we're doing a pilot on Pompeii. States are already implementing it. HERS is funding implementation. How do we put that all together? So how do we think about the research in the context of state-based implementation and you know, PI-directed studies that have very specific questions about these conditions. Um, we want to make sure we, we fulfill and, and serve all of those stakeholder groups. We want to think about, in the IT world, the birth screened and the cases enrolled. You know, screening is a large number.
number. Diagnosis is a smaller number. Clinical follow-up, you know, we want to follow those kids. Whether they begin their lives in Georgia and move to Florida and then Colorado, we want to follow them as they grow up and we learn more about the diseases. MBS here went and wants to provide that coordination and tools, and we want to have linkages to other NIH databases. As um, sort of the intro said, I was part of the Human Genome Project, but I ran an IT team. They didn't often let me in the laboratory, although I looked in the window a lot. Um, but I worked with the folks that run NCBI and NLM, and part of that is dbGaP, dbSNP, understanding variation across the genome. And that's really what we're starting to do and what you guys do every day. Even if you don't use genomics or whole exome or whole genome, you know the genotype of your patients. You're thinking genetically, obviously. And so starting out at that basic level of what's a genotype and how does that correlate, we want to be able to build those into um, national databases. At NIH, with a focus on patient outcome research, we want to understand what kinds of standards are they using at the PCORI grants, at AHRQ, at NHLBI as they look at sickle cell disease, at NINDS as they look at Duchenne. We want to use those same questions and answers. We want to ask birth weight, birth date. We want to ask height. We want to ask those all in the same way. That seems really trivial, but you would be surprised how many different ways there are to collect that information. If we're going to be able to aggregate that without having a person there to say yes, no, we have to be able to do that in an informatics way. So as I said, you can learn more about our um, tools, but basically we're building systems to enable researchers in public health to have access to specimens to understanding screening technology performance, to look at outcomes in natural history, and to think about the special considerations when you do research or any kind of piloting with newborns as your main focus, where parents need to be educated and consent for um, the babies. So today I'm focused on longitudinal follow-up. So we have the tool called Longitudinal Pediatric Data Resource, or LPDR, and we're really trying to build a system where you can begin to plan your research, collect and contribute, query and analyze and report and share. And the idea is to use a standardized system to collect information across the conditions that are part of newborn screening and candidates for newborn screening. So as we sort of think about this little, you know, I think um, Dr. Kathy Swoboda drew this um, with me as she was thinking about her SMA study. So you can see, you know, thinking about the demographics, you know, what kind of language is spoken in the home, all the way to what's the result of a six minute walk test. That's a lot of detail. We have a lot of clinicians who are funded who want to ask thousands of questions. What we are sort of challenging groups like yours is to help us define what's the important questions. We can collect 6,000 questions and answers, but should we? What are the main questions if you could ask them across all of these conditions that you would want to do? We have a tool called the Data Almanac where you can go in and especially for Dr. Singh's team, you can access all of those thousands of questions that we've put together and create your own REDCap data dictionary. We use REDCap as our data collection. We have to employ IT people to make you know, that system. What we built was a tool where you can pick and choose as clinicians and pick and choose the questions you want to ask and push a button and make a REDCap data dictionary and then make your case report form and then begin collecting information. So from REDCap all the way through to the longitudinal study, we hope we're building a tool for data collection. Data collection happens in the clinic. We want to begin to think about genomics, so we also have a tool called Viva. You can't really see it down there, but you could Google it, where you can begin to bring in cohorts um, based on phenotypic information and genomic information, and then ask questions about that, and try to begin to see what information across the genome might help improve outcomes in the kids. Um, we're beginning to create data displays. So this is just the number of researchers that have enrolled in using MBSTRN by the number of years. These are research projects that we have going on in states, and these are some research projects by condition. You can't really read these, but most of them are the inborn errors of metabolism, and then the different colors um, are the different clinics that contributed that information. Um, so some key takeaways, we want to be able to build tools for researchers, clinicians, and public health. 
We want to meet privacy and security standards. That's one of the first questions we get. We have a you know 20 page data sharing agreement that people have to look at and review with their IRBs and their attorneys before they can put data into the LPDR. And we want to work with clinicians and experts to define those questions and answers that we should be collecting across the board. Um, we want to help define clinical histories of these diseases. As you all know, we still don't quite understand PKU, right? Every single condition we're learning more about as these patients age and they live longer and throughout their lifespan. Um, we want to be able to monitor patient outcomes in multi-state pilots as we're looking at candidate conditions and conditions that are um, just added. We know, and I've heard from um, Dr. Watson a lot, and you all know, as you add something to population-based screening, you learn more about that disease. As we added SCID to population-based screening, all of a sudden we had atypical T lymphocyte, um, you know, a so what do we do with those? How do we treat those patients? Are they watch and wait? What do we do with the late onset Pompeii cases? What do we do with the variants of unknown significance? So we have to begin to track that information now as we move from a case-by-case -case and clinical presentation to population bases. So we want to create these data discovery tools. This is a data discovery we call MB Smart. We did have MBS Mart, but we thought that would be like marketing or something. Um, but we have this tool that we would love to have you mine the millions of data points that we've collected. We want to give those access to this. We want to help let you um, sort of hypothesize your research questions. Does genotype predict outcome? Does genomics improve timed diagnosis? All of these questions, we want to help you access the data, the data that maybe you've contributed to or maybe your colleagues have built over years. We want to take patient registries and put them into this system. We just migrated the worldwide registry on Crab A disease into this system. So now we have 180 Crab A cases with a lot of really great data that people could mine through and begin to ask questions of. Um, so then we focus on the public health through the NCC and, um, you know, here are you guys. Um, so we wanted to learn from the regional collaboratives and we wanted to understand what are they thinking about as they look across their region, as they try to improve genetic services and treatment and public health, how could we be helpful? So we wanted to take a different approach to the questions and answers. We wanted to think with our public health hat on and sort of, you know, that's where they get to the chase. You know, how are the kids doing? Are they getting the medical foods? Are they in, um, you know, are they under a clinician's care? How many times did they use the ER? So we wanted to work with all of these um, public health partners to really begin to think about how do we build this system and where do we get the answers. So in public health, we don't see patients usually. We need to go to the clinicians to get the information. I'm not quite sure how to draw this picture, so maybe clinical care should be a lot bigger circle because ultimately all the information comes from genetic counselors, speech pathologists, you know, teachers in school, um, you know, nutritionists, you know, as these patients grow up, that information comes from um, clinical care, and we want to use it to foster research and public health understanding. So as we think about the sort of PIs and researchers, they have a lot of questions, and they might want to understand things like natural history. We worked with all of our experts to come up with a core set. So this is the lowest I could get them down to is about 200. And 200 questions like family history, name, demographics, you know, some key components about diseases. And then we worked with a public health group that Dr. Singh was part of and came up with a list of 30 questions. And these are, the 30 were sort of defined into 14. So across these, these are the things that we heard from public health might be important if you could follow the kids that were identified with a newborn screening condition. Um, so currently, what we've built at ACMG is this shared space to exchange the answers. So we've talked a lot today about the questions and how we built that, how we standardize it, how we talk to other people who have come before us. And now we want to create this space that you can access to begin to understand the questions across different diseases. So we currently have 24 projects. We have projects that are looking at the natural history of 
um, conditions that are currently screened across the United States. We have pilots of candidate conditions. Um, Dr. Wilcox in Georgia leads three of those pilots. Um, we have some public health focused efforts in different states and different regions across the United States. And then we're working with four groups who are beginning to explore the use of genomics in the newborn period with healthy cohorts, with kids who are identified with a routine newborn screening condition, and then with kids in the NICU. Um, so right now we have um, 1,500 data points. You're like, Amy, you said you have millions. Well, we have millions. These are the questions that we have. We have those questions longitudinally. So for some patients and some um, research subjects, we have 32 entries. And so we have you know, 15,000 times 32, depending on the study. So this quickly explodes into a really big data set. Most of the data, as I think about it, is focused on the clinical visit findings, the laboratory findings. And then you can see 15% and 10% demographics and family history. Um, we try to do or try to encourage you know, a three-generation family history. We want to get a really detailed family history into these databases, and we want to begin to follow demographics to enable the secondary use of this data. A PI might have a, you know, a hypotheses around a clinical finding, but public health could come in and say, let me look at the zip codes, and let me look at the zip codes across our state and see the number of clinic visits or the number of ER visits. You guys can begin to think much better than I can about how to begin to use this data. We want to make sure that we're collecting the data from the primary you know, investigator or public health state, but we also want to make that available for other people to look at. Um, so these are just, again, some selected analysis that we kind of, we throw these out at meetings like ASHG and ACMG and try to get feedback from people on what should we be planning for as, you know, software developers. I've got a whole team of developers. They're always like, what are the requirements? What are the use cases? How are people going to use this? We don't want to build a system and then have you come. We want you to come before us to tell us, you know, how to build this really smartly. Um, these are the cases by cohort, so you can see, I guess the picture didn't come out, I, sort of. So 65% of the cases that we currently have in the database are hemoglobinopathies. This is a huge project funded by HRSA to enroll um, adults and young adults living with sickle cell disease, and it was an outreach through community-based organizations. We quickly saw, we've been working for years, maybe a decade on the inborn errors of metabolism, but boy, you get those community-based organizations out there and they enroll patients and friends and family and they have the disease themselves. You know, we just saw an explosion in the number of um, cases that we could put into this database. Um, and then we have really detailed information, 25% on inborn errors of metabolism, and just beginning with the lysosomal storage disorder. So with Pompeii, MPS1, you know, understanding Crab A, even though Crab A isn't part of the routine newborn screening, it's being done by states. So we want to follow what's happening. We want to understand and be able to advance um, the research. And then we have about 7% in SCID. SCID was a great implementation project for us at ACMG. We were funded by um, NIH to coordinate a really large pilot of um, SCID. It was a six-month pilot. We were able to collect about a million cases in those six months because we did high throughput newborn screening in New York and California. And by doing that in a really quickly wet, quick way, we were able to accumulate some cases of SCID that hadn't been seen before. So kind of to begin to get that clinical heterogeneity by doing population-based screening. Um, so these are our cohorts by state. You can see the southeast region has a lot of cases. Um, so you guys may not have put this data in, but you can look at the data if you apply to use it. And in a lot of areas, you have put the data in. You may just not know it. Um, we wanted to look at, this is just some things we pulled out of the data, identification method. So how did we find out about these cases that are enrolled, the majority by an abnormal newborn screen? But you can see, we still want to follow kids that have a clinical presentation. Um, newborn screening is not 100%. We still have false positives and false negatives. And we want to be able to understand the heterogeneity in the conditions. These are the cases by condition category. 
So at the secretary's advisory level, we always think about the routine newborn screening panel and how they're organized, amino acids, fatty acids, organic acids, and they have biotinidase as an other, galactosemia as an other, endocrine, hemoglobinopathies, hearing loss, CF. We don't have hearing loss and CF on here right now. That's because we don't have any researchers that are funded to do it. If you come in with data related to that, we would love to be able to put it in. But this just gives you an idea of the data that's there. And I think I looked this morning, we have 68 um, SCAD in the database. So um, this is just a little screenshot by the actual condition. You can see, as you guys would predict, most of the cases are PKU and um, MCAT and then biotinidase. Um, this is just a picture of you know, what that looks like. So these data displays, we can make available to you. So if you ask your question, then you can begin to look at, do I have enough of an N? What am I seeing in my clinic? How could I further you know, an understanding of this disease or improve outcomes? Um, these are the number of cases per clinical site. So to protect privacy, you know, I didn't put what clinic it was, um, but you can see some of they're just numbered by how they went into the database. But you know, probably your institution is here or a neighboring institution. Um, and so if you had approval to look at this and we had approval from the people who put the data in, you could know where those kids came from. They may go from your clinic to another clinic. And so another thing that we're implementing at MBSTRN is a global unique identifier so that we can begin to track these kids as they go across um, different cities and counties and con um, states across the United States. Um, going back to the idea of what's important. So the public health group that Dr. Singh is part of, you know, sort of wouldn't let him out of a room till they came up with maybe the minimum set of questions. And still, this isn't disease specific. So then I go right away to, well, what's the important question for MCAT or VLCAT? And I'm not a clinician, so I need you guys to, you know, tell us. But what they came up with was we wanted to know the diagnosis. We wanted to know whether they had condition-specific care in the past 12 months. We wanted to know the date or age of appropriate intervention and whether they're alive or deceased. Each of these questions needs a definition behind them. What do you mean by appropriate? What do you mean by intervention? So that's the next step that this work group is working on if they would return my phone calls. <laughs> Nobody wants to work on definitions, but it's the most important part. Um, then they came up with an expanded set because you know they wouldn't let me out of the room if they could have, couldn't have more questions. So they wanted to think about reason reported for no treatment cause of death, whether the child is developmentally appropriate, and how many ER visits, hospitalizations, and clinic visits. So quickly, I see us going down to the 6,000 questions we had for the Inborn Errors Project, but they're all great questions. I mean, I know each one near and dear to my heart, but you know, we want to focus over here, and we want to make this data available to um, clinicians, researchers, and public health. So um, Yetza and Dr. Singh just asked me to give a little tour of how some of the states are already beginning to use the data. So Missouri had built, um, they call it MoCare or something. They had a system to collect long-term follow-up data in Missouri. Um, and so because they already had some data, we wanted to see if you looked at those early 14 questions, you already have your database, could you answer those questions? So you've already been working hard collecting information. I think this is sickle cell and then PKU. So they wanted to see out of their data, could they just do data mining? you know, without seeing a new patient. And they were able to answer some of those questions. If we look at only the four and can define how we answer those two questions, you know, we may be able to get further down the road. Again, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. If you already have an access database, I love it. If you have an Excel spreadsheet, if you have a different way that you're tracking your patients, your whiteboard, we could, you know, pull this <laughs> into the pull this into the database. Um, New York and NIMAC have several efforts related to long-term follow-up. So they have a big um, IT provider who enables them to do long-term follow-up. They aren't able to keep up with a new condition, so they're going to be using our system for Pompeii, XALD, SCID, and MPS1. So we were lucky to work with New York State 
to build those collection tools. And then now NIMAC is taking a step back and looking at health outcomes related to PKU. So every state, every region, every clinic sort of has their focus. We want to make sure we can enable them to begin to ask and answer the questions that are important to them. The Arkansas group, um, Dr. Brad Schaefer, um, I trained under him. So I've talked to him for a long time about long-term follow-up. They took our infrastructure, and so did Sue Berry's project. So we built this infrastructure, but we can give it to you. If your institution says it has to be within our firewalls, we'll give you the system to collect and analyze the information. We did that with Sue Berry's project at MPHI in Michigan. They had the data set. We gave that to Dr. Schaefer. Dr. Schaefer worked and expanded that. He got funding through a foundation. They call it Angels Newborn Screening. A part of that is long-term follow-up. They're just finishing their fifth year of data collection. And so I wanted to have them look at their data set and see if they could answer what at this time was the 14 questions. And they think that they can answer about three-fourths of them, either directly or indirectly. So, you know, we're doing a pretty good job with predicting what people might want to ask, but it would be better if we were at 100%. So where are we different? What did he think was important? They have conditions we don't have. They have hearing loss. They have CF. They have things that we would love to get into. So they took our, you know, what we built, and then they expanded it, you know, which you can do, and we can show you how to do that. Um, so I just want to say thank you for having me, Dr. Singh, and allowing me to um, pitch our ideas, you know, hopefully start a dialogue, have you guys tell us what you think about what we're doing, um, both with HRSA funding and uh, NICHD funding, and to thank Dr. Singh's team and the Georgia Newborn Screening Program, um, Judith Kerr, Emily Painter, and Teresa Pringle, all the really important people that help focus our efforts. There's a lot we could do in newborn screening research, but we want to focus on what would be helpful, both for clinicians, parents and families, public health, and our federal partners. We might be in that, you know, science walk area of having to convince legislatures of the importance of newborn screening again. Even though we have the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act, we might sort of have to, you know, go back to the future and talk to them about outcomes, and that's where this data could be really important. We work closely with the CDC, with APHL, and with the National Library of Medicine because they're each funded to do something different of this little, you know, conglomerate of information. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to build on what APHL is doing. We want to build on what CDC is doing. And we want to take advantage of what NLM is doing across NIH. We have a lot of ideas about research opportunities, funding opportunities. I have a whole list of FOAs if anybody likes to write grants. I would love to talk to you about them. I would love to put you in contact with project officers at NIH and FDA and other places to begin to think about these projects. And then as Dr. Singh gears up for another three years, understand how we can help you in CERC to stay the best regional genetics network across the United States <laughs> um, and, you know, and understand how we can meet your goals. So with that, we've got a little questionnaire or something, but does anybody have any questions for me that you would like to talk about? Thank you. Babies are great. Adria's work in our department. Um, she has been very instrumental in the technology piece here with the newborn screening database you see, which was developed here. And at National Library of Medicine, they usually ask for our examples to demonstrate with what she has done in standardizing the language. Uh, I'll tell you a little example. We spent half a day figuring out at the NLM meeting how to uh, code for propionic acidemia. Some people wanted it PPA, some wanted it prop, some wanted it, you know. It, it, so there were a lot of issues that have gone behind in standardizing technology and building this wonderful database in our department. Um, and I think I just wanted to acknowledge, uh, particularly with your technology yeah. interface. And yeah. she, she's very aware of all the standardization you have used nationally yeah. to interface. So the coming group, the research group, when you think about it, we are already uh, positioned from standardization with what 
when we would be talking about, um, so it would be fairly easy yeah. for and, us. And you're right, I mean, your team meeting with you guys, you guys were at that public health meeting where we locked the doors and said, what's, yeah. you know, and, you know, without you guys on the ground and, you know, having you think through how is this really going to work, you walk the halls with these clinicians, genetic counselors, you know, nutritionists, speech pathologists, you know, educational experts, you know what they're up to and what they, you know, could tolerate. Um, if we don't have people that are seeing patients enter the data or figure out a way to capture that data, we'll never be able to get to the answer. We'll have you know, individual research projects that take one look at a disease, but not really answering all of the questions that you might have. So that's what we're kind of challenging you guys to think about is if you could ask in questions about any of the conditions that you see, what are those questions? And then can you narrow them down and do any of them, if you go on our data almanac, do we have that question? And you can give us feedback. You can say, hey, this is the one question I love. This is the two questions I love. We know right now this is volunteer, right? So <laughs> I hope someday we could, like, I don't know, figure out a way to make this worth your while. But we really need to start building sort of crowdsourcing. And I know some people in um, IT are now beginning to get into philosophy and how do you encourage people to share data and to collaborate and all that. And, you know, um, you know, I ha I'm not there yet because I think that we can, you know, everybody can have the same goal and then we can get there. But I think it's something, what's the incentive? We always, what's the incentive for you to, you guys all have busy days. I can't believe you're here for an hour even. Um, it's probably the pizza, right? Um, so, yeah. I have to see what kind that is. is it, a, it, it might be Atlanta special. <laughs> but, oh yeah. No, but really, um, you know, we all have busy lives, but in, if you, as you see patients, as you see newborn screening, as you need new conditions getting added to the panel, what's the question you have? You know, why are we doing this? Or what's the? Genetic counseling group here too, and our leader, Dr. Gambella, will be leading the division in this. So I think it's important for us to recognize. I just wanted to be sure we all knew these resources are already there to get started and not to start creating locally, sitting in a room and saying, look at the data elements. We can just kind of start seeing what's done and then moving forward. That was the intent, really, of bringing uh, Amy here today to talk about this. I so. think too, if you and if you want to talk about anything or wrap yeah. up, Brian, you can talk about this too. Well, I think one of the things is, you know, as we continue to add, um, diseases to newborn screening, I think it's really important to have a long-term follow-up to see, are we making a difference? Are there disorders that maybe there really isn't much intervention, and why are we spending money from a public health standpoint on those? And I think, you know, having data for our legislators who aren't always scientifically savvy that demonstrates unambiguously that we make a difference, that putting money into this is worthwhile. I think that that's really important. And so I think that's the importance of long-term follow-up. I also think it's great to know that, you know, we've, yeah, our newborn screening folks, have, we've talked about having a more formal, well not even more formal, having a long-term <laughs> follow-up system. And I think we can probably use some of the tools you've already discussed, right? So I think that that is great. Yeah. Um, we would love to do that. And I think, um, you know, thinking about, you know, your idea of, you know, how are they doing in school, IEP or not, special ed or not. That saves money, you know, uh, how to, yeah, and that's where we need to get to is, you know, that next step of the so what question, so. And I also think starting with, uh, starting with the pilots, so what uh, Dr. Gambello just mentioned, the ones we are starting, the one Dr. Wilcox got funded and Don and all are working already on it, I think maybe start thinking, building that long term right up front as a pilot to share nationally what we are learning because 
people are doing these pilots and the word doesn't get out. So I feel they are such small numbers when we are starting, and the we'll be in the forefront of those issues. You know, so. and you're, you know, one thing is I think about pilots and um, listening to what you guys have said. When the routine or recommended uniform screening panel came out, there was the core conditions and secondary. We always said we're going to revisit those secondary. So our, I always hear there's like, you know, 17% or so of the panel that California never sees, our biggest state. And so how do you even do analytical validation for diseases that you see very rarely? But maybe they're still important. So even if you guys can think about revisiting you know what's on the panel even as you think about data that would be so helpful at a national level and that would be something you know we fly into DC if you want to come and present and you know I think just having people like you who see these diseases or don't see these diseases and you know help guide our efforts mine was just a question if we wanted to use the data that has been collected so far what are the logistics around that and how long does it take to get it so you can apply on our website. So if you go to mbstrn.org, register for the LPDR, level one and level two user, and tell me what you would like to do. And then we'll, we contact the person who put the data in, unless they've published on the data. So we have sort of a deal with researchers. If you've published this data, we want to put it out there for other people to look. You might have been looking at you know, genotype. They want to look at zip code. So we want to be able to make those data sets available, but we want to respect the people who put the data in. They often want to publish first. They want to think about the data, but they want collaborators. So we've never had anybody say no. So you just have to apply as a data user, and then we have an agreement for you to sign in. It's mostly about protecting privacy. You know, with rare conditions, there's always the chance you could do re-identification. We want it. We have, you know, provisions in there. You know, don't re-identify. If you accidentally do, let us know. You know, if you publish, you know, we want to know about it so we can really build this research network. We're the, you know, newborn screening translational research network. We're just the coordinators. You guys are the network. You guys are the regional genetics services. You guys, it's you. You know, we're just the one, we're just staff. And so we need you guys to use the tools, tell us how you'd want to use them. And turnaround time, it really varies on what you want to do with the data. Um, so... You know, we're still in the beginnings of people wanting to use data, so it's hard to answer that, but we try to be as quick as we can. We're excited about it, so, yeah. Anybody else? Thank you. Stay dry. Thanks. So is there, do you ever run into the issue of like who owns the data or do you, are you pretty open to anyone can access the data? Um, you know, so who owns the data is the person who put it in and if they're doing active work on it. And so they, so like if you guys wanted to use Sue Berry's data set, you would apply for a data user. Say you wanted to look at PKU, the subset of PKU cases. You lay out a research plan or just a few questions. Hey, I want to ask about the relationship between PKU and diet. And then we go to Sue Berry's and they have a whole system and we apply for you. And then they say yes or no, or they want to collaborate or they want to understand more about what you're doing. So we're staff, so we try to make that easy for you. We want you to come up with the ideas. We want to help execute those ideas, and then we work with the PIs or the originators of that data unless the study's ended and everything's public or they've published and everything's public. Then we're going to push everything out so even students can begin to understand rare diseases and newborn screening conditions. I mean, how great would that be for your genetic counselor students or you know, any students anywhere um, wanting to begin to learn about this data? Thank you. Thank you.